So we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we have to bear in mind the context into which the Apostle Paul is writing. He's writing to a church that has lots of problems and challenges, division, immorality, litigation. They are abusing the spiritual gifts. This is a young church. And they are an immature church. Of course, the root cause of all these problems of division and all the problems that are going on in this church is pride. The root cause is pride. If you trace back all of these problems, you'll end up at pride. Someone says that pride is a national religion of hell. Pride is what caused a beautiful, gifted, celestial being created by God to become Satan. Because Lucifer got lifted up in pride and thought he could overthrow God. He was thrown out of heaven. In Proverbs 16 verse 18 it says, Pride goes before destruction. And a lofty or a haughty spirit before a fall. So pride is a very dangerous thing. And all of us are battling with pride. I don't know about you. But we are all battling with our pride. And when I say pride, I'm not talking about being proud of something. I mean, it's really arrogance. Arrogance. All sin can be traced back to the root of arrogance or to the root of pride. And pride has one aim. Pride wants us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Romans 12 verse 3. So pride says, I'm right all the time and everybody else is wrong. That's what pride does. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And what we're going to see in this lesson is that Paul is going to be chipping away at the pride of this church in Corinth. Now in the last lesson we saw that God had devised a way of salvation that does not depend on human involvement and does not need any human wisdom or righteousness and this is the wisdom of God so that none of us can boast apart from glory or boast in the Lord Ephesians 2 8 and 9 so none of us can boast about contributing to our salvation because God set it up that way that it has no human involvement we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Alone, So we can't take any credit for our salvation. And this is the wisdom of God. Notice that God brought down pride. So pride, pride is a problem. Pride is a problem in our world. Pride is a problem in our lives. But notice how God brings down pride. God brought down pride through the ultimate act of humility. What is the act, the ultimate act of humility? Jesus Christ, God condescending and becoming a man at the hands of his own creation, being cruelly murdered even though he was innocent. He was ill-treated, he died, he rose again and ascended. That's the ultimate act of humility. So God takes pride out. But when we are immature and we walk in the, in the place of strife and division and all these challenges that we see in the church in Corinth, what we're doing, we're putting back into the equation what God has taken out. That's what we're doing. So what Paul's going to do here in this passage, he's going to be chiseling away, he's going to be chipping away at everything that the Corinthians are taking pride in. And in this passage, he's going to go back to the very beginning of him journeying to Corinth 
and meeting with these brethren. We have to remember that Paul is the founder of this church in Corinth. So our theme is growing up in the truth today, growing up in the truth. And I just want to jump into Acts 17 before we go to the passage, just to set uh, the backdrop to this. So before Paul arrived in Corinth, he was about 35 miles away in a place called Athens. Athens at that time was the intellectual and philosophical center of the Roman Empire. It was filled with very, very bright and smart people. So Paul, for whatever reason, arrives in Athens alone, and that's not the normal pattern for Paul. He normally travels with someone. And in the New Testament, we see that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. So this isn't the normal pattern that we see in the New Testament. But in this case, Paul arrives in Athens by himself. He visits the synagogue, which he always does. However, what we see in Acts 17 is Paul kind of evangelizing in a sort of low-key manner. He's not going all out in his evangelistic efforts as he normally does. And Paul, the scripture says, he even goes down to the marketplace. And there he's he's sharing about his faith, which is all low-key. And he meets a group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, and they begin debating with him. They couldn't understand what Paul was talking about, so they called him a babbler, because they thought he was preaching to gods. They thought he was preaching about Christ, who was the Messiah, as one God, and then they thought he was preaching about Christ, the resurrected Christ, as another God. So they couldn't understand what he was talking about. So these philosophers arranged an invitation for Paul to give a presentation to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus is the high court of Greek philosophy. And you could only present in the Areopagus by invitation only. You can't just turn up and say, well, I've got a new philosophy and I want to present it. You had to be invited. So this is a big deal for Paul. He's going to stand before the brightest men in Athens, which is the center of intellectualism in the Roman Empire. And he did. He did, and he, he presented to them his message of the gospel. And what would happen there is that once you sort of present your philosophy, the high court would judge, well, is this a sort of take of the Stoics or the Epicureans or someone else's philosophy? Or is this legitimately a brand new philosophy? And if it was deemed that it was, then you, was, you were then deemed as a philosopher. You got yourself a philosophy, and now you are a philosopher. However, what we see in Acts chapter 17 is that Paul presents a very eloquent message. And some of the scholars say that this is the most brilliant message from the Apostle Paul in the Scripture. The only one thing we see from this, though, is that it doesn't yield much results. Only a handful of people give themselves to Christ as a result of this brilliant, eloquent message that Paul presents here. So Paul then leaves from Athens and he's heading to Corinth, about 35 miles. And I think in his mind, he's probably thinking... Well, that, that, that didn't work out too well. I presented the, the, the best message possible that I could put together and only a handful of people <laughs> responded. So I think on Paul's journey, and remember they walked in those days, they didn't have cars, they had to walk. I think in his reasoning, he decided, you know what? I'm going to change the way I present the gospel. I'm going to make it just simple, straightforward, and to the point. And in contrast, when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
Paul mentions Jesus 17 times in 1 Corinthians 1. In Paul's message in Acts chapter 17, he doesn't mention Jesus not even once. So you can see Paul is thinking this through, on, on, he's evaluating and he's walking to Corinth. And, and he's going to change the way he presents the gospel. So we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 now. It says here, and I, brethren, when I came to you, remember he's coming from Athens, didn't have much success in Athens. He says, when I came to you, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can you see how Paul just narrated it right down now? From this philosophical, intellectual, eloquent speech to all I want to preach to you now is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, you're lost. You're lost. You're on the way to hell if you don't know him. But you can be saved. If you receive his sacrifice on the cross, you can be saved. So that's what Paul's determined in his heart and mind, and that's what he's going to present, not just in Corinth, but everywhere else that he goes from here on. We see here that Paul, the great apostle Paul, and in my opinion, he's the greatest missionary that has ever walked upon the face of the earth. He reached the then known world in a matter of 20 to 30 years. And remember, they didn't have telecommunications, didn't have transport like we had, so they had to walk everywhere. So he was a great man, but he, he, he didn't get it right all the time. He didn't get it right all the time. That blesses me. <laughs> you don't have to get it right all the time, but as long as you learn, you learn. The worst thing is to do something that's not right, and then you go on and do it again. So Paul just changed up his strategy. He said, that didn't work, so I'm going to change up my strategy. Amen. So Paul was a flawed man, just like all of us. Even though he was a great apostle, he's a flawed man. He has his faults and failures. But Paul is growing in the Lord. Paul is growing in the Lord. And you can see in the scripture the progression of his humility. He refers to this three times specifically in the epistles. First time he refers to himself in the epistles, he says, I am the least of all the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15.9. A few years on, he refers to himself again. He says, I am the least of all saints. Ephesians 3.8. And then about 20 years after that, he says of himself, I am the chief of all sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15. So as Paul matures in the Lord, notice that he sees himself lower. As Paul knows more of the Lord and he matures in the Lord, he sees himself lower. So he's the least of the apostles. Then he's the least of all saints. And then finally saying, I am the chief of all sinners. So the closer we get to God and we understand more about the holiness of God and how righteous God is and how just God is, for the authentic believer, we should be seeing ourselves lower and lower and lower not being lifted up in pride. We become more humble before the Lord. This is what we should be experiencing. A continuous erosion of pride as we get closer to God. We see ourselves lower. We see ourselves becoming more like Jesus. Amen. So Paul has great intellect that he can use to impress but he chooses to bring Christ and him crucified. That's a choice that he made there. Amen. And I want to encourage us, as I did last week, to read our Bibles, to, to study our Bibles, to look into the full counsel of God. Not just to 
buffet style. Pick your favorite verses. But, and that's why we're walking through Corinthians. We're walking through it literally uh, section by section so God can speak to us from his full counsel. That is so important that we see Christ from every angle in the scripture. And we really get to know him. That's how we get to know him, by seeing him from every angle. And my role as a pastor is not to be perfect. I am not, I'm not perfect. No pastor is perfect. You see, you say, amen then. You never have to ask you for an amen. <laughs> Where's the truth? No pastor is perfect. And this pastor here is not perfect. But what I... I'm charged to do is to bring Christ to you and him crucified, but not just from select passages, from the full counsel of God. That's how we get to know God. That's how we get to know him better. So I'm encouraging you to press upward toward the goal of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14 and why? Why is that my role? Why is that the role of every pastor? Because we want to see ourselves transformed. Amen. The more we know Jesus is the more transformation takes place in us. Now, all illustrations and analogies are limited. So just take this for what it is. I did the, the best I could to, to bring this out. My role is not to teach you how to behave. That's called reformation. To teach you how to behave, to tell you how to live, do A, B, C, run your life this way and that way. That's reformation. You see the example there? It's a crushed up piece of paper and it's reformed through a process into an image that looks like a bird to me that can fly. Been reformed. But well, then that can be changed, can't it? You can take that image of a bird, you can make it into a car, you can crush it up again. So the role of coming to church, reading our Bibles, the pastor's preaching, is not to reform us. Please go forward. Well, it's to transform us. Can you see the difference there? It's from a caterpillar right through to the stage of a butterfly. That's a transformation. You can't reverse that process. When we are transformed, we begin to live like Jesus. When we are reformed, we can try and live like Jesus. <laughs> but sometimes we, we, we kind of slip out and we don't live like Jesus. So the point of our preaching and teaching is not to reform. It's to transform. And how, how, do we, how do we go through that process of transformation? By getting as close to Jesus as we can, by knowing Jesus more. Then when you know Jesus, the behavior will follow. Because you want to please Jesus. Is anybody getting this? Yeah, so we're not uh, teaching a set of rules and behavior. We're saying get close to Jesus through the scripture. Even the scriptures that you don't particularly want to read see Jesus because it says that the whole volume of the book is written of Christ so in every page of the Bible we see Jesus right in the middle of it and as we read and we look into the gospel and we get to know Jesus more then we are transformed and this is a continuous process for the Christian amen verse 3 says I was with you in weakness in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith this is important that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God so Paul says I was with you in weakness and fear and the scripture records in Acts 18 I believe it is that Corinth was the only place where the Apostle Paul was afraid remember I shared with you that um, 
Paul's not no kind of scaredy cat. He was a rough, tough tumbler. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. So he's not no scaredy cat. But in Corinth, Paul was afraid because of the wickedness that he saw going on there. But note, he said, I don't come with persuasive words of human wisdom. Because he wants he wanted their faith to stand in the power of God. You know, we're not Christians because um, someone persuaded us to become a Christian. You can't really persuade somebody to become a Christian, you know, through arguing with them or debating or bringing facts. You know, because human wisdom is like a kaleidoscope. It changes, doesn't it? At one time they were saying the world was flat. <laughs> but we now know that the world is round. One time they were saying that everything re revolves around the earth. Now we know it's the earth that's revolving around, don't we? I remember one time when they were saying to everyone, get diesel cars, it's better for the environment. Let's bring it closer home. <laughs> I've got one. And now I'm being penalized. Have you seen the price of diesel? More expensive than petrol. You can't drive certain places if your car's older than a certain age. So that, that's the wisdom of humans for you. One minute they say, eat this, it's good for you. <laughs> Next minute they say, don't eat that anymore. It's changing all the time. So if we become Christians because someone has persuaded us, or perhaps because you feel, well, I've done all my research, I've looked into all the various religions, and I've concluded that, yeah, Jesus Christ is the Savior. We're not saved that way. Or perhaps you've done some great feat or some great challenge. You've climb Mount Everest and stuck a flag at the top and you feel yeah now now I can be saved because I've, I've, I've had to do some kind of work I can't just accept the gift of Jesus Christ as a free gift I've got to do something to just make myself feel kind of worthy of this great salvation <laughs> if you're saved that way believe me it ain't gonna stick because only through faith and by the power of God can we be saved. The transformation I talked about earlier can only be wrought by a working of the power of God in one's heart. Not through acquiring facts and, and data, only by the power of God. So what I'm saying is if you can be persuaded to give your life to Jesus, guess what? You can be persuaded to change and go to another religion or do something else. So it's, it's not by human persuasion. It's by a supernatural work of the power of God. That's the only way we can be saved. So I want to encourage you, if, if, you're, if you witness to somebody, and we, do, we all do this. We try to have all the facts at hand, don't we? And sometimes after we've had a conversation, you think to yourself, well, if I had known this, or only if I had said that, then maybe they would have accepted. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> We're just called to sow the seed. It's the Holy Spirit's power that convicts one's heart and brings about that work of transformation. So you can just, just be, be a bit easy on yourself. Just plant the seed. That's what we're called to do. Plant the seed. Pray that it falls in good ground. So what we need to do when we witness is pray that the eyes of those that we speak to are opened. Amen? Amen. Verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And by the way, the mystery 
Does it mean something spooky or secretive? It means something spoken of which is now being made known. I remember growing up in church, they used to have this thing they called mystery. I don't know if you had it in Wolverhampton. Well, we, we had it in Hansworth, certainly. Sorry, Hansworth, for dissing you, but that's the way it was. Some mysterious things used to happen in church, and you used to leave church scratching and like, well, what was that about? So it's not talking about that kind of mystery here. It's talking about what was prophesied, what was foretold, which is now being revealed. So it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What this is saying that the men that oversaw the crucifixion of Christ, Pilate, Caiaphas, the high priest, the Sanhedrin council, all of these were very, very intelligent men. But the point is they, they, didn't, get, they didn't get Jesus. They didn't understand what was going on because they weren't converted. They weren't followers of Christ. So again, just to say that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory had they understood who he was and what he came to do. So this is a mystery that was prophesied, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And I believe this, this scripture is speaking, and it has a future element, it is speaking of heaven. But like a number of scriptures, this particular verse here is multi-layered. You know, when you read the scripture... Some portions of scripture have a meaning for the past, for the present, and for the future. This is one of those passages. And I believe here, in this context, it's speaking of those, if you connect it to the, 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 the verses before, I, I believe it's speaking of those who were in charge of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They didn't understand what they were doing. So how do we understand the gospel? Verse 10. It says, but God has revealed them, and this is talking about these mysteries that were spoken of aforetime. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So verse 11 here is, the scripture is talking about God, what God has revealed. But what he's saying here in verse 11, that you can't know somebody unless that person reveals themselves to you. So for instance, I can't know you unless you choose to reveal yourself to me. And you can't know me unless I choose to reveal myself to you. You can study me. Yeah, so you can... You can watch me, and from that you may be able to deduce some of my likes, some of my dislikes. You could hire a private eye investigator to follow me around for two weeks. Or if you could access my Google, what's that thing? I've got this thing on Google. At the end of the month, it tells me everywhere I went. <laughs> so if you could access that, you could see where I'm going. But that doesn't mean you know me. Because if I don't choose to reveal to you, I've sat in meetings and, and rooms in meetings where my opinion and my way of thinking is totally different from everyone around the room. If I keep my mouth shut, nobody will know. <laughs> so you can't know someone unless that person chooses to reveal 
themselves to you. And in like manner, we can't know the mind of God unless God reveals himself to us. How does God reveal his mind to us? The Bible, hopefully you got one in your hand or close to you. The Bible is the mind of God to us. That's how God reveals himself to us. However, even reading the Bible, if you are not born again, the scripture says you can't understand what you're reading. You can't make any sense out of it. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us as we read the scripture. He will teach us all things, John 14, 26. So even for those of us who are born again, we read the Bible, we have understanding. We can't boast about that. We can't be arrogant about that because everything we understand about the scripture, we only understand it because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us. He has made it clear and known to us. So we can't boast about that. But there's an important point here for us all. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. How often do we ask the Holy Spirit to teach us? When we read the scripture, or do we just read it? How often do you come across something that you don't understand? You take time and say, Holy Spirit, I don't understand this. Will you reveal to me what this means? Have you ever done that? He's a master teacher. And you may not get it straight away, but I'm telling you, if you... Just be patient. God will bring to you the meaning of that passage. It may come through preaching. It may come through a Bible study or prayer meeting. But it will come to you. So let us invite the Holy Spirit to reveal the mind of God as we read the word of God. In verse 14 says, What the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, without the Holy Spirit revealing the mind of God, you can't know the mind of God, no matter how hard you try. You're just not going to make any sense out of it, just like what Pilate and these guys did. They had the law, they had the scripture, no doubt they, uh, the high priest, the, the, the Sanhedrin read the scripture, but they missed the Christ. They missed him totally because you need the Holy Spirit to make that known to you. So to them it was just foolishness. They just can't receive it. So going on, we're going to see here that the Apostle Paul is going to introduce three types of man. Three types of man. And in verse 14, it says, he, he speaks here of the natural man. The natural man. The natural man is an unbeliever. Someone who is physically alive, but spiritually dead. So that's the natural man. In the version that was read earlier by Daniel, I can't remember what term it used. It didn't say natural man. It used another term. But in this the New King James Version, or King James, it says a natural man. Someone who's physically alive, but is spiritually dead. How did this come about? Well, God said to Adam in the garden, the day you eat of the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. What did Adam do? Adam ate the forbidden fruit. Did he die? How did he die? So he didn't die physically, because we know he lived for many, many years after that. But he died spiritually. And then every child of Adam that was born after Adam was born spiritually dead. Born with a dead spirit. That word in the Greek, I am not going to attempt to pronounce it. But it means natural. It means soulish. And it means sensual. So to be spiritually dead means that you're governed by your soul. 
Your soul takes the lead on anything that you do. And your soul is made up of your mind, will, and emotions. So to be spiritually dead means that you're governed by your soul. In other words, decisions that you take in life, by and large, sometimes are based on our, how we feel, isn't it? On our emotions. Our soul is king in our lives. That's what it means to be spiritually dead. And as I said before, when we're sharing with uh, our loved ones or whoever you meet, the gospel, it's hard for them to receive because they're spiritually dead. It would be like trying to communicate to a corpse. Have you done that? I did it when my mom died. She can't hear me because she's dead. So it's like trying to speak to someone who's alive physically, but their spirit is dead. They just can't receive the things of the spirit. So what we should do is not get frustrated or get upset or anger about that. Pray for that individual or pray for that person that the blindness which is over their eyes will be removed. Amen. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. Pray that the blindness be removed, that they can then receive the truth of the gospel and be saved. Now we're going to see here another man. So that was a natural man, physically alive but spiritually dead. Now we're going to see the spiritual man in verse 15. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So the spiritual man is someone whose spirit has been made alive by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord. So this person is physically alive, but also spiritually alive. And then there's a third man, which we're not going to deal with today. It will be in the next lesson in chapter 3. The third man is the carnal man. So the carnal man is someone who is born again whose spirit is alive, but that person's life is dominated by the soul, by the, by the flesh, carnal. So I want you to know that if you are a spiritual man, when I say man, I'm not just talking about males. This is the language of Bobby's, which obviously includes females as well. So a spiritual person, we have living inside of us the greatest instructor, the greatest guide, the greatest counselor is living inside every born again believer. But are you listening to the counsel of the Holy Spirit? Are we walking in his guidance or are we carnal and just doing our own things? Verse 16 says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instructs him but we have the mind of christ wow the holy spirit in us makes known to us the mind of christ remember the holy spirit is not going to force himself upon us we have to invite his counsel we have to invite his 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 wisdom and as simple as that may seem oftentimes we don't we try to figure it out ourselves or we are dominated by our emotions or by our soul or by our flesh. But the Holy Spirit is living inside of the believer to make known to us the mind of Christ. This is what happened to the reformer Martin Luther. He didn't set out to be a reformer. He was a humble Roman Catholic monk. And the Holy Spirit began to deal with him about the word of God being the authority in his life and not the traditions of men. The Holy Spirit began to illuminate in Martin Luther's heart the word of God and to say this is what should govern your life, not the laws and bylaws and of, of the church or traditions of men, but the word of God. And then Martin Luther began to understand that he was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2. And he began to, to write about this. And he was called up to a high court and before the officials. 
and his life was then put under threat because of what he was saying and what he was writing. When he was put on trial in front of a great council of dignitaries, and they said to him, you've got to stop writing and, and, and saying this stuff. He said to them, basically, this is what I am seeing in the word of God. And he also said to them, if you can show me in the word of God that I am wrong, I will accept it. But if you can't show me, I'm going to stand by what is being revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. And you know, as a result of the Holy Spirit speaking to Martin Luther, today we have our Bibles. We have our Bibles t today. And he was the founder of the Reformation. May we also allow the Holy Spirit who lives in us to illuminate the Word of God and transform us. We don't just want to be reformed. We want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, a brand new person. I don't know about you, but that's my experience. When I came to faith in Jesus Christ, I became a different person. Not by me making an effort. It wasn't reformation, or else I would have gone back. I don't think I fully computed and understood at the time what had happened to me, because my testimony is not one that you could make a film out of. It was, just, it was just so simple. It's almost like nobody would really want to know how, how I got saved. I didn't have no bright light flash. There was no angels. I didn't see anything. It was just an ordinary day. The only difference is I bowed my knee and accepted Jesus Christ. But from that moment, and I didn't realize it on the day, I, I felt exactly the same. I didn't feel no different when I got up from my knees. On my way back home, I didn't feel any different. I went to my bed, I didn't feel any different. But when I got up the next morning, and I drew the curtain, and I looked out, the grass, <laughs> it looked so green. The sky was blue like I'd never seen it before. And I felt like I had Dr. Martin's on, air cushion soul. I felt like I was just floating around the place. And that was a witness to me that something had changed. But more than that, more than that, and I've shared this with you before. In school, I was playing the clown in school. Can you believe that? And my grades were just dropping and dropping. I was in the top set when I started secondary school. And my mom warned me. She said, Ruben. They're going to drop you out of the top set. <laughs> and we just take it there like, like a joke. And one day they came in and they, they just took me out of the top set. Just as my mom had prophesied. <laughs> and then I became even more of a clown in the class. But when I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, I was 13 years old. So this is, this is no human effort. Me trying to change myself, me trying to be a better person. Nobody was coaching me. Nothing like that. I accepted Jesus Christ on an ordinary Tuesday. No elaborate testimony or anything. But the moment I accepted Jesus, I started to change. And the company I was hanging out with, I didn't go around telling them, look, I'm a Christian now. I can't do these things now. I can't go around with you. They just didn't want to be with me. <laughs> they didn't want to be with me. And then the deputy head teacher called my mom to a meeting. German man, Mr. Hess, never forget him. And he said, Mrs. King, something has happened to Reuben. I don't know what it is. Something has happened to him. And if he puts his head in his books, he will actually leave school with a qualification. Now tell me who could do that apart from the Holy Spirit. A 13-year-old, where would you get that knowledge from to do that? So then I knew 
that I was saved and I begin to see my life transformed, not reformed. My life transformed before me. I wonder if anybody in this room, because you, you might be thinking, well, I'm thinking about giving my life to Jesus, but I, I, I don't know if I could live that life. I don't know if I could follow all those rules. And we make all sorts of excuses, don't we? Give it another year. I'm not quite ready yet. I'm saying to you, just as my life and many of us in here, our lives have, were, were transformed. God will transform your life, not by your human effort, not through you making great attempts to be a better person, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will regenerate you on the inside. He will make you a brand new person. God will come and change the desires in your hearts, turn you around, set you in the right direction. If you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have to worry about how you're going to do that. That's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if anybody wants Jesus in this house. Does anybody want Jesus in this house? Does anybody want more of the Holy Spirit in this house? Because you can have as much of the Holy Spirit as you want. You know, you can limit how much of God you want in your life. And for some of us, we're probably satisfied. We're thinking, well, I'm on my way to heaven. I think, I think this will do me. But you can have more of God. You can have more of the Holy Spirit. You can have more of Jesus in your life if you are hungry and thirsty for that that will not be forced on you you've got to have a hunger and thirst for it the scripture there is equal 47 1 to 6 where the prophet goes into the water and the water just catches him at his ankles but if you're happy we're just standing there with the ankles that's that's fine but it's, this is a river so there's more so you, you can step out more let it come up to your knees and some people are happy with just standing around in the, in, in the river of God at their knees. I, I, I was there one time, I remember. I remember I, I, I'm a musician. I remember I went out on this tour in Europe, six weeks tour, going all over Europe to different countries. But I felt empty. I felt empty. I could play, just standing up there on the stage playing, but I thought, I've got nothing to give. I just, I just feel empty. And when I came when I came back from that tour, I said, you know what? I, I, this water's just catching me at my ankles. I'm, I'm going to start stepping out a bit further. And it came up to my knees. And, and there's still more when it comes up to your knees. You know that, don't you? Yeah, you can step out a bit more into the things of God. Let, let it catch you at your waist. And you might be happy to stand there with it at your waist. Feels good. Temperature of the water is nice. It's flowing past you. But you might be saying, I'm not going to step out anymore because then I lose control then. You see, at my waist, you know, I, I'm in control. I, I can move to the left, to the right. I'm in control. But what God is saying, step out, even when it catches you at your waist. That the water can take the whole weight of your body and then God is in control. Anybody willing to do that in this house? That's where God wants you to go. He wants you to, to launch out where the, the flow of the Spirit then takes you. So I had no plans to be a preacher, no plans to be a pastor, no plans to be in ministry. Because music was my thing. That's what I was into. But you see, when, when I come back off that tour, and I stepped out, I said, God, I, I want more of you. Because I just felt like, oh, just a, a, a clanging gong, just an empty vessel. I want more of you. So I began to seek God in prayer. And when I bought myself a study Bible, I started to put my head down in the Word of God. I started to see God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And over time, God began to transform my life. No, no plans to be in ministry or anything like this. But as I then began to swim out, then God began to change the direction where I thought I wanted to go to really place me where he wanted me to be. I know God is speaking to someone in this house today. Some of us, the, 
The flow is, is at our ankles, some is at the knees, some is at the waist. And God is saying to some, there's more. How thirsty you are, are you for more of God, for more of the Holy Spirit, for more of what God really has intended for you and where God wants to place you. And you may not even see that in your mind's eye right now. You can't reckon and, and, and kind of see this is where God is going to lead me to. But God knows. And all I can say is embracing the will of God is the best thing that I could ever do. That's why I say to you all the time, I'm here and I know I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be here in Wolverhampton Church. This is where God has placed me. How much more of the Holy Spirit do we really want? We have a proclamation. We're going to say this together, then we're going to go to God in prayer. But even before we say the proclamation, if you're here and you sense by the Holy Spirit you're being called into something deeper, I want you to join me here at this altar so that we can just pray together. My experience is my experience. Your experience might be totally, but I just know I felt empty and I desired more. God is faithful. When we reach out to him, then God is faithful. He answers our prayers and he fills us up more. Amen. Anybody here want more? I can't believe there's nobody here who doesn't want more. We should be hungry. Just please come forward if, if you would be so brave. Just come forward, please, if you want more. Hallelujah. Stepping forward into what may be not familiar, but... I'm telling you, it's the best thing that you will do in your life. And it's not for us to predetermine what God is going to do. It's about God's sovereign will. Why he created us. Why he's placed us where we are. Why he's blessed us the way he's blessed us with certain gifts, privileges. That's what it's about. Letting God have his way in our lives. Can you just put that proclamation up on the screen, please? We're going to say this together. It's based on John 7, 37 to 38. But I've just reworded it in a way to make it into a prayer today. Let's say that together. Jesus... I come to you believing for more of the Holy Spirit in 2024. As the scripture has said, out of my heart, let rivers of life-giving water flow. Do you believe that? We're going to say it again. And then we're going to go into time of prayer. The leaders who are amongst us, you're welcome to join me in praying for those who have come forward. Let's say it again. Jesus, I come to you believing for more of the Holy Spirit in 2024. As the scripture has said, out of my heart, let rivers of life-giving water flow. Amen. Amen. Just begin to praise God. As the scripture has said, God will fulfill it. Lord, we hunger and we thirst for you. We want more of you. We want more of you, Lord. We're not satisfied with where we are at. Lord God, we, we're, by faith, we're stepping out into the deep today. We're moving forward, Lord, into more of the flow of your spirit, Lord. I pray for any of us in here who's on the periphery of the river of the Spirit. Lord, that you will begin to nudge us, nudge us into the center of your will and your purpose. In the name of Jesus, God, we, we let go of our own way, Lord, and what we think is best for us. Lord, and we, we lay aside our pride, Lord, and we, we, we put on the shoes of humility. In the name of Jesus, Lord, and we say to you, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. We are empty, God, and we desire that you fill us to overflowing today in this sanctuary. And even for those who are watching 
online oh god he said blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are those who are bankrupt of self bankrupt of pride in the name of jesus and lord we just thank you father that you are the one who is filling our hearts you are stirring our hearts you are stirring our hearts lord you are creating in us desire and discipline lord god in the name of jesus lord that you can establish your work and your will and your purposes in our lives father and we yield ourselves to give you total cooperation we will cooperate with your spirit oh god as you bid us to come lord we yield ourselves to your to, to your purpose to the higher goals that you have set for us lord because you want to use us in ways that we cannot even imagine eye has not seen ear has not heard neither has he entered into our hearts lord the, the purposes that you have for us in this present time lord and father i know it's not too important sometimes to know the next step and the next step after but lord we just want to follow you in simple obedience lord just obey just obey obey lord trust and obey there's no other way there's no other way to be fulfilled in jesus but to trust and obey hallelujah i'm going to ask the leadership team can you just come we're going to anoint we're going to anoint those who have come forward we're going to anoint with oil and just pray that in you god will stir up his purpose and just allow us to just let go of self self needs to get out of the way self needs to get out of the way hallelujah and these leaders who are praying for you it's not because they're perfect we have our own needs and we need to reach out to we need to let go of pride and selfishness too but we are the vessels that god is using on this day hallelujah 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 hallelujah